Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mitten Backstage. Thanks so much for joining us today. Again, I'm Dutcher Snedeker, for those of you who might just be tuning in today. Welcome. Happy to have you on board. Plenty of interviews to check in the backlog, too, if you want to see the journey from when this podcast started until now. But today's episode, I'm chatting with my good friend, a great recording artist, a member of groups like Paddlebots, and just a stellar musician all around. His name is Adam Marth. Now, I've known Adam for a few years, and we've collaborated on some recordings together. He was part of the Michigan Recording Collective cover of a snarky puppy tune that we did uh, back in 2019. He's also sat in with my band Normal Mode, and we've played together on other gigs as well. We've co-billed with our bands, but it was great to catch up with him, see what he's doing during this typically slower season for musicians, uh, what he's working on, the things he's watching on YouTube. A lot of, we talk a lot about different cooking channels because we both have a passion for food and looking at people making tasty food. And we also talk about plans for each of our groups this year and what this year is going to be kind of focused on. So it was a great conversation all around, and I'm happy y'all could join us today to hear it. If you like today's episode and you want to contribute to podcasts like this that I do, or Life is a Piano, my other podcast, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Snedeker. There you can contribute at different tier levels to get access to all sorts of perks. It's being retooled and a little streamlined for 2023, and I'm looking forward to sharing all of those updates with you in the next couple of months. You can also check out DutcherSnedeker.com for everything else that I do around the internet. You can find what I do on YouTube, Instagram, occasionally Facebook. I'm trying to stay a little bit active on there, but mostly Instagram and YouTube at this point. And if you want to check out some of the music that I do, Earth Radio, my band, just put out a new single called Space. This came on the heels of our sold-out shows at the Roger B. Chafee Planetarium for their Concerts Under the Stars series. Again, thanks to Dizzy Bird Records and Saugatuck Brewing Company for sponsoring these concerts. It was such a good time. We loved doing it, loved working with the staff, loved presenting the music with the visuals. Nate Isinger did a great job designing everything. John did a great job running sound. Jack curated a great experience for everyone in the space. It was just a great time all around. So again, check out Earth Radio's new single, Space. You can also check out the track you're hearing currently on Blushing Monk's record, that is my jazz project. And you can check out my group, Normal Mode, which today's guest also has collaborated with. All right, enough about me and all the different things I can do. You can click links, check out things in your own time. Let's get right into today's episode with Adam Marth. Yeah, um, the second one, Mamma Mia was like right before the shutdown. So everyone was getting COVID and, you know, what we didn't know was COVID. So people were in and out getting sick and that's happening a little bit this month, but I think things are starting to even out. Like the, sure. the choir director and a chunk of the cast was sick the first week, the theater director and a chunk of the cast were sick last week. And then this week, it seems like, People, like the majority of people are able to make their call times because it's um it's also nice that it's not uh every day being full cast it's like all right today we're just working on you know the trios and some staging or we're working with these specific dance numbers or so it's it's a little more organized around the fact that a lot of the people involved have either done a production at West Shore Community College, or they've had theater experience, or they know how to teach themselves their parts. So, oh, that's cool. That's cool. To yeah, <laughs> machine running smoothly and stuff. I mean, with that big of a production, that yeah, it's it seems like it's a rare thing where everything is just moving in the right direction all the time. I'm sure there's like you know probably some little micro behind the scenes. I know it was tricky to find, uh, there were a couple like small roles that we still needed to fill that didn't really have a ton of singing or, you know, they didn't need to be in any of the dances. They just had a couple lines. And I know that the Dean of the college is playing, um, uh, Betty Blast, <laughs> the restaurant owner in the musical. Okay. And then, 
Um, the sound tech, uh, Adam Knutson, he, um, you know, he does a great job with Geralt from uh, Big Round Sound. Um, and they do, you know, a lot of events up and down west and northern Michigan. But um, he's playing, I think he just yesterday committed to playing the the coach, which just has like a few lines and I think is in the chorus. <laughs> okay. I'm not too familiar with the cast of Footloose and the whole, I, you know, I have a general idea of what the plot is, but um, yeah, I know Kevin Bacon's in it. Um, yes, that's... <laughs> and I've had to well, I've play the Kenny Loggins song a time or two in my life. But. Right. Yeah. As a, as a guitarist, I'm sure there's <laughs> no shortage. Do you know this riff? It's like, yes. <laughs> It's, it's a silly one it's a silly one but actually that's on the uh that's on the all-american funk parade canon so sometimes that comes out at some of the more squirrely weddings that will be thrown out but <laughs> yeah that's that's like well i thought it was funny too that um there is a uh like like i don't because i never saw the movie i just know the references from i don't know like family guy and whoever else is parodying it um but yeah it's it (laughs) it is a funny premise of just like it's like they move out of the big city to this tinier town and then in the tiny town is like it's almost as if like Cause I think about like when I, whenever I've moved, I mean, I've moved a lot, but like if, if I moved to a new area, it's not like, all right, the entire town like swarms you with like, it's like, as soon as they move, it's just like, Hey, here's the church. You're in school. You're doing jobs. You're doing all. And it's like, I've never <laughs> like hitting the ground sprinting. Like welcome to our town where we all have, there, there's no singing and dancing, but we all have choreographed music numbers. <laughs> Here are the rules, yeah. <laughs> and you'll also dance and sing and meet everybody once you get here. Yeah. That's pretty cool, though. Very... <laughs> I was going to say inclusive. It's probably not inclusive. That's probably not the word I'd use. But... Yeah, you know, it's... It, 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 I think each musical I do, I... I see the the tropes that kind of stay through each musical of just mm-hmm. like, you know, there's always, there's, a, there's, it's a multi-layered villain. You know, it's like Footloose has Shaw, who's kind of the, the pastor who made the, somehow convinced the town council to have no dancing or something. And then there's like the, the youth villain with, uh, uh, his name Chuck Cranston, who's just like the dirt bag of the town, <laughs> and is like, you know, the, a scumbag to the main character who ends up falling in love with the new kid. And then there's like, I guess, just the general like suspicion and judgment from the town of like, who's this kid coming up from Chicago? And I'm like, <laughs> it's like this is why people don't move to other towns. I can't they just get bullied by everyone. <laughs> So you're from Chicago. You think you're so big and tough? And they're like, no, we moved here because we couldn't afford to live there. It's like that's in the plot. It's not like they're like, you know, it's like, yeah, I moved up here to start a, a, a another Wendy's franchise and like build a Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> There's a cool guy with your jean jackets, cool shirts, fun hair. Yeah, that's that's wild, man. Yeah, the music's fun though. It's that's it's a, a lot of uh, good stuff. <laughs> is that that's a uh, what is it? Is it called Lake Michigan College or West Shore or what's it? Uh, yeah, uh, West Shore Community College. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah, we're doing we're doing two weekends of shows, and I, I have to double check, but I think we're doing uh friday and saturday nights and saturday sunday matinees so we're doing four shows a weekend wow 
Um, plus, I guess each week has a Thursday show. Like one is a like a thank you to the donors and their families show, and then the others like was it the the Zanta program? It's some like arts program in one of the somewhere. I have no idea. I just know it's a lot of high schoolers that show up who mm-hmm. either like theater or in the arts of, in some way. So. Right on, man. Yeah, that's, that seems, it seems like a lot of work, but it seems like it can be super rewarding when it goes well, you know, I've never done, that's one gig I've never done is like a pit gig or anything like that, where it's like, all right, you're going to play eight shows throughout two weeks or something. And it's got to be the same thing every time, you know? Yeah. Well, up until I subbed in for wicked, like in 20, uh, 2017, um, I, the only times I'd done musicals were in the same vein of like, all right, from start to finish, you're like rehearsing with the cast, you're learning, you know, the, the music, but you're also, you know, as the cast gets more comfortable with the script, you figure out some of the timings for transitions, you get, you know, all the details ironed out. Um, but with Wicked, it was like, I, I think the show, when it came to DeVos, the show was, uh, it started like the weekend I got the music. <laughs> and the first thing I had to sub on was on that Sunday. So I, I got the music on Monday, had like no time to look at it, fumbled through it at the Tuesday rehearsal with the rest of the pit, with the director being like, are you going to be ready? I'm like, I have to be, I don't know. (laughs) And and then uh, they, they had it set up with their touring rig where um, um, they brought an extra station as like a backup or like uh, in my case, it was to ghost the show. So I did two shows with the pit where all of my stuff was in my earphones with a mix of the rest of the pit and the cast. And then I did, I think I did Friday and Saturday both nights just to get used to like how the show went. And then Sunday was the first show day (laughs) and I did six shows over the four or two weeks, two or three weeks. I can't remember how many weeks it was there, but um, yeah, it was way different than, than how the West shore ones have gone where I'm like, I don't really know how this musical goes. And then I listened to the album, like, all right, I kind of get it. And then I'm like, Oh, it's this week. (laughs) (laughs) Just learning the music as I go. Like, trying to read my parts when there's like because all the keyboard one parts are conductor scores too so it's just like uh, any page could be like all right your two staves are at the bottom and then above you is six different staves for all the other parts (laughs) (laughs) yeah let me just let me just look at those two real quick yeah let me zone in on that yeah and then that's a lot of prep man but yeah it's, uh, you know, I'm as much fun as it is. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think of like, do I want this next year? Cause last year, the musical that, yeah, this was supposed to happen last year and, uh, Omni, the Omnicron variant, um, uh, canceled it cause Ludington had like a 25% infection rate, um, so every event they were doing at the high school or at the college or wherever, somebody was getting COVID, somebody was going to the hospital. Um, yeah. So they were like, we can't do it. But uh, in, you know, all that work dropped out like a week before Christmas. So it was like three weeks out from when I was expected to do it. And I had been contracted since the September before that. And when that all bottomed out, I found a ton of work and like, you know, had that residency with normal mode that you were involved in and like a bunch of things came out of it. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So even if, even if something burns down, (laughs) there's still something I can pivot to. And it made it, it got me thinking of like, what else could I do? That's like, you know, more impactful to like my artistic growth, but also maybe an opportunity for the community. Um, 
And yeah, it's got me thinking of like, how could I, like, do I take a year off? Do I, you know, I mean, I mean there was already two, two years between the, uh, between Mamma Mia and this one. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause you know, it's nice to have like a place to stay. It's, you know, it's nice to kind of escape a little bit into a different environment for a while, but there's also that feeling of like, man, I really just, (laughs) I want to put this much effort towards like my stuff. (laughs) Right. Right. But I mean, yeah, that's, that's the tricky thing. Cause it gets you in that mode of, it gets you in that mode of like, I don't know, at least for me, I would be, you know, when I'm in more routine and stuff, more routine oriented, like my gears are like moving. And I think about all the, I'm not really explaining this like (laughs) way, but no, I, I see where you're coming from, man. That's, I see where you're like, I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. It's, I mean, it's the thing too, or like, I don't, obviously I'm grateful for these opportunities, but there's also something to be said. Like I was talking with Rufus Ferguson the other day, um, who is a, you know, I mean, you, have you met Rufus or at least heard of him? Uh, I've, I've, I've heard of him. Yeah. Does he play Oregon? Yeah. He, he, uh, he has a gospel background. He's also classically and jazz trained. He's, okay. Um, living in Detroit right now. And I, I think he, I mean, he, he plays on a lot of cool stuff, um, mm-hmm. but he's, I forget what his academia jobs are. I don't know if he's involved with like the MSU community school, like, you know, the thing that uh, Chris Johnson puts together or my friend, Sammy Blosser is also involved. I think Adam Maynarding, Minerding, <laughs> a sure. bass player from Lansing. I think his partner is also involved there. But, um, uh, he, we were just talking and I brought up the fact that I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of shrinking away from doing a lot of weddings this year. Cause I have just been burnt out with all the, all the, the sameness of the weddings. And he was like, yeah, man, I was, gonna, I just dropped out of weddings altogether unless I schedule a ceremony. And I'm like, oh, that would be great <laughs> just to like, not have to like only have to play <laughs> weddings that I could kind of curate if anything, but is it cool it if just, I just bring my amp and then, you know, just set up <laughs> and then I'm, I'm gone by 6 PM. Yeah. <laughs> they'll get a fat paycheck. That's yeah. That would be cool. But. Yeah. It's yeah. Cause it, it is like, I mean, you do, do you, are you involved with like, um, I know like, Haruki from, yeah, you you, you know Haruki, but to the audience, Paddlebots, you're you're part of Paddlebots, and I know they pair off and do some wedding stuff here and there. I don't know if yeah. you're involved in any of those. Um, I am from time to time. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, well, they they have a offshoot group, um, that's under our LLC called Cabin Guys, so that's like their wedding band. Um, okay. and there's three different guitar players, kind of in well, three or technically four different guitar players in rotation. Um, and the main kind of the main two is Connor Larkin. Um, he plays guitar and he sings, I mean, he's a killing guitar player. He's a killing bass player. Um, and then Ethan O'Brien, who's the paddle bots. He's been there since the get go of paddle bots, ripping guitar player. And then if for some reason those two can't do it or Connor can't play bass, I'll play guitar with them um, for their wedding gigs and stuff. So, um, yeah, was that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, at least the involvement. I, and I was just thinking too, like, cause Haruki had mentioned to me about, you know, occasionally they need a keyboard player. Mm-hmm. Um, and just kind of broke down the the model they do. And I thought it was, you know, I, I like it better as a foundation because it's like more, more base pay, less, you know, having to be there the entire day to get to that amount of money. And yeah. then 
just coming in, doing two sets, having people have a good time, end on a high note, gone. Like no <laughs> three sets plus extra pl- or sometimes four sets and a cocktail or <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like it's I can't keep giving up my whole day to see someone else be like, I spent four billion dollars on this wedding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh the guy the leader of Cabin Guys, Josh Lee, he is a very he just has his stuff together so well, you know, and he's very good at expectations for the like and having everything in writing, you know, because we both played weddings where I'm sure like there maybe hasn't been a wedding coordinator or something and like they haven't like really spelled maybe they haven't spelled out stuff to the band and it's just like all right like maybe sometimes you play for four hours or sometimes you know like like the father of the bride speech is like 30 minutes you, you know what I mean like right so yeah Josh is a good force behind that because he acts as like kind of like he all, he does all the admin stuff like very well, um, but he also just like keeps the show rolling very well in a nice, in like a friendly way, but also like hey like like we're we're done at this time tonight, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's helpful. It's helpful to have that person, you know, for sure. Yeah, because it that is one nice thing like being involved with Blue Water Kings like there is a ton of work out there for people who can like get on the roster and just, I don't know, get booked on all these things. Um, but yeah, it's just, (laughs) I don't know. I just need a break from, uh, you know, I I think of like all the, the art that I consume that I'm like, no, these guys are doing weddings. (laughs) They're not, they're like me. If they do a corporate gig, it's like, you know, more in line with what they're, trying to do as as artists versus just you know pure jobbing and i i get too that at least from my perspective being single and not you know having an immediate plan to start a family Mm -hmm. especially being single (laughs) um you know i i would imagine my priorities would change if that were the case like okay let's look at music academia part-time and something else let's look at you know, scheduling a few higher paying gigs in and around some lower paying stuff. But I think as far as, you know, like earth radio has come a long way and we have a a fun year this year that we're planning, um, especially kicking off with these planetarium shows and, uh, you know, normal mode, we're kind of navigating around like Ian just finished his degree. Nathan just had a kid. So we're, plugging our schedule in like can we play you know maybe a couple festivals or you know we have some opportunities with uh like different science related things like we're gonna play an observatory i think and I heard some other that. yeah <laughs> all right the one in yeah, april I don't, that, I, uh, I don't know if i'm allowed to say he actually hit me up to like maybe sub for you on some science gig like in a yeah astronomy day gig. it's gonna i mean it sounds super cool um i don't know if it's gonna he hasn't like completely confirmed but i hope he does that'd be sweet yeah i think uh because we just met for rehearsal because we we're working on um some new stuff and um uh we i mean we had mentioned like uh having you on board for that gig regardless just because I, um, I double checked with earth radio and we have a lot of stuff, uh, that we're, we're basically trying to book out the Friday before up until that following Friday. And we only have like two days in that chunk that need to be filled. Um, and when I brought up Saturday, they were like, yeah, if we can come, like, we'll go see you play. (laughs) So they were fine with it. Um, Cause yeah, especially like I, I sent in the group chat, I want to figure out, um, Genevieve Artati's new song, um, you know, sings with nowhere and she has her own projects and the band for this album is like, 
you know, it's Lewis Cole on drums and uh, Chiquita Magic, who's another singer, synth player playing like synth bass. And then mm -hmm. uh, Chris Fishman, who tours a lot with Lewis Cole. And, you know, you can't, you know, Jacob Mann's busy or, you know, whoever he, uh, else he hires, Paul Cornish. But uh, the guitar player on the record is um, Pedro Martins, that like Brazilian fusion awesome player <laughs> might know him if i if i see him I, yeah I'm, I'm not familiar with the name though yeah he i you know i'd be curious to see like more of his his story because i think he i mean part of it was moving to california but he it seemed to be taken under uh kurt rosenwinkel's wing like he opened for him on a stretch of shows and um kurt i think recorded on Pedro's like debut record. Um, but yeah, he's just, he's one of those dudes that like, he, he plays a guitar that's like, you know, some hollow body that, you know, can't be super, exp it looks like a cheaper guitar, but the way he's, you know, it, it his talent transcends the need for <laughs> yeah. anything better. <laughs> like you just, you're like, how does he get that sound? Oh, cause this guitar is cheap, but his skills are like, way you know doing more you know making it sound way better um and he uh it well in the song it's like it's a very simple like here's the melody and it's like one paragraph of lyrics and then there's a synth solo and then a guitar solo and then the song ends and i'm like perfect <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so Always Malcolm something form, you know, I love it. Yeah. And okay. out though, I, I'm, you know, I'm always on the hunt for good hollow body players. Oh, yeah. Straight ahead, you know? Um, yeah. Man, that Lewis Cole album is pretty wild. I haven't, I haven't been on the radar for Genevieve's new stuff, but that, that new one he put out this year is pretty nuts. It's, it's so like, it's, it's one of those albums that I'm like, everything that I enjoy about Lewis Cole is on the record, but right. then it just bumps it up that much more where you're like, how did he get the, that guitar warbly texture? How did he make that synth pad so expansive? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. How is he able to get away with so many, like, you know, like there's like a couple songs where it's like, you know, like, um, I'm tight or, uh, dead inside shuffle where it's like, all right, it's this over and over and over and over and over again, but it never feels stale. <laughs> yeah. That's, and, that's the wild thing about it. It's almost like, it's just like a continuous loop, but it's always like the, there's this weird feel component to it that is just always like right on the money and just like the amount of like i mean just like figured out acoustic guitar for that one song you know i don't know if he's like played before but um yeah i'm sure his i'm sure his slap bass played a role in figuring that out because it's a very like right-handed pattern but that thing's crazy man i don't know that guy's wild yeah and like and just having like so many um what was it so many like just times where you you're listening to the song and then there's like an earworm or a hook and you're like wait wait how did <laughs> it's like this song's also catchy like it, it doesn't seem like anything has like like e each song has something memorable about it whether it's like, you know, like let me snack where it starts all calm and, and comfortable and then it just hits you with the noisiest dubstep yeah. drop. <laughs> is that, is fun. that the one like, is that the one before bitches? Cause there's like a really nice, I think it's like a similar, no, let me snack. I know what you're talking about, but there is like another yeah. nice, like very just like wayfish boy choir song and then it goes into bitches which is just like 
<laughs> wild <laughs> time. You know. Yeah, so yeah I think. Yeah, that because yeah, that song go, like it hits the like. <laughs> and just all the drums. <laughs> it's just like a. I think I like them because it's just like a good reminder. Like include humor in your music, you know, and not take yourself too seriously. You know, he he's very. I mean, he's obviously very out front about that. You know, get up front about it. But you know, music doesn't have to be so serious all the time. And I I suffer from that. You know, or just like thinking that it has to be the serious thing in every component. You know what I mean? But it's supposed to be fun, man. You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of been the, uh, at least if my goal for this year. Another reason why I'm trying to free up more time. Like, even if I'm not, even if I'm not gigging out with like earth radio or some band every weekend and it's just the, you know, the old goat or something. Um, just being able to like recapture the fun because i you know i remember like as hard as music school was like there were a lot of fun moments in practice rooms with other you know friends making music trying to you know figure out tech or you know late nights in the in the music center just you know goofing around with ideas or you know recording something for fun and and uh you know when you get out of that environment you're like all right i need to do the you try and like streamline the things that make you money with all the skills you have but then it's so easy to get like you get to a point at least how i feel where i've built up a network and i've built up you know people that i've played with and experiences and that's always you know something i can fall back to i can i can be a support i could be a side man i could be an accompanist i could be a you know all these support roles but then there's you know, Earth Radio in the back, who's been in the background, obviously a focus, but like in terms of like growth, it, we really had a good year last year. And the last couple years have been very transformative for the band in terms of like our dynamics, our goals. You know, we have this EP coming out in March. We're going to have another one that we're going to, you know, make a whole other campaign around. <laughs> and uh, we're just really trying to, you know, continue the trend of like making art that we enjoy, but that also, yeah, does it, that has been a, a recurring theme is like not take itself too seriously. Like something that is, is dynamic emotionally as it is musically. Um, Cause there can be people who genre jump and, you know, it's like, okay, cool. You went from a cha-cha to a, a burning swing to fusion to, <laughs> Yeah. Like, and, and it gets, you know, it might just look like, I don't know, a, a textbook or something where you're like, and this is how we have incorporated cha-cha into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, but it, it is also like a fine line, right? You know, it's just like, cause like for me, like I also like, I feel like I do create my best stuff when I give it like 110%. You know, mm -hmm. but you know, I guess my what I'm projecting or saying is just like my struggle is how how to include both those parts. You know, like not taking yourself too seriously and like remind you know feel man you know stuff like that. <laughs> and also, like I'm a kind of cerebral, methodical guy too, and I can't ignore that so, that side of myself too. So it's like that weird pulling pulling act right push pull act yeah and it's and it's like you know artists you know to the horror of some people they change <laughs> and and you know they don't necessarily like i think of i think of a one of the hilarious attempts to rebrand um was uh and i don't even know what they're doing this was like years ago and they put out a single and they got some buzz on like guitar world or something. Um, but it was winger, the band from like the eighties yeah. and you know, their hit song. <laughs> it's like, they can't sing that now. They can't sing 
17. <laughs> she's much too young, but she's old enough for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Some crowds, I don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like I'm at the point now where I feel the the want to change as I've, you know, my health's been improving and, you know, things are starting to get more organized and, um, you know, I want to continue that trend, but then also apply that to like, all right, I have, I've had these ideas kicking around. Some of them are easy to execute. Some of them are like, I need to do a little bit of extra planning, but how can I make certain things happen? Especially if I want to like, you know, grow my Patreon or, you know, grow these podcasts or it's like, how do I, how do I create things in a way that feels good, but I'm also balancing it with this like attempt at (laughs) trying to live more normal hours and, uh, I don't know, like not get to a point like last November where I was like, I can't, I just can't. There's so much happening all the time. (laughs) Digital overload. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's tricky. I mean, but there's like, it's, it's a weird thing to navigate, you know, like what are the expectations of the modern musician, especially in the digital realm. Right. So, and like, how do you, how do you feed yourself? But also like, artistically you know satisfy yourself it's pretty right. wild how do you have you enjoyed using patreon that's something that i know as a band paddle bots has kicked that around i've personally thought about it for like guitar stuff but i know that that's like a that's that's definitely a commitment um how has that been for you yeah well yeah, because I've I've had patrons. I've had a basically the same amount of patrons between like patrons the last two years, and that's been nice. Like I I just realized, oh, the money I had never set up bank transfer, so all the money was just sitting in the Patreon holding account. Um, so that's came in clutch this month. But um, it's the thing I did that I'm starting to dial back and this kind of goes in line with trying to streamline more things. So I'm not, you know, sprinting to another gig and being like, what do we do? Okay. This part. Yep. Cool. Blues. Yep. Cool. Okay. See you. And just leave. <laughs> like getting, uh, cause when I started the Patreon, I like, I went a little, you know, overzealous, which I think a lot of people do. They want, you know, it's like, how do I get more people involved? Well, I'll give them an insane amount of value. And then it's like, all right, but I'm over promising and under delivering because <laughs> I'm one human. Yeah. Um, whereas like, I think of, you know, like Amanda Palmer is always someone who's brought up as like a fundraising, you know, queen. Like she's just, she had a project like on Kickstarter that was like, all right, I need a hundred grand to make the, these things like this, you know, commissioning all these artists, putting together this art book, putting together this very detailed, you know, musical experience, and then offering these other things. And people gave her like over a million dollars. And I'm like, okay, I don't necessarily need, it'd be cool if that happened, but I, you know, how do I get, you know, a hundred people at, five dollars a month like that would be interesting like what would that do in terms of my ability to create or what could patreon cover in terms of the operating costs of what i do um so it as as i'm thinking about how to go into it this year it's i think it it makes more sense to use it as a a means of like like part archive part you know um which i'm even thinking about like what would that mean because like everyone wants all of the content free (laughs) so it's that you know trying to figure out the the best model and and really it's having to try stuff like i kind of let the patreon exist as it's been the last couple years 
and it stayed consistent for the most part based on you know the people who are supporting me they either also have patreons so they know what it's like or they're musicians or creatives of some type that enjoy i don't know supporting other creatives and um you know it would be nice to get some people that don't have patreons <laughs> so it's you know i like the solidarity obviously but I don't want to have to take away from their earnings to also have me earn money. Cause then it's like, do, do I subscribe back? But then I'm just giving back the $5. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you mean. Yeah. So, so there's a bit of a insular community going on there. Yeah. It's what well, I think also part of the tricky part is um, some people don't know what it is. Like if they're outside of the creative space, they don't, they don't know what it is or if they hear, subscription they're like i don't need another subscription <laughs> it's like i'm already subscribed to peacock paramount plus netflix hulu <laughs> disney plus <laughs> i'm like but you, you could support independent creators you, the, you know the tech giants are monopolizing and content is <laughs> actually being harder to post it <laughs> no get out of here with that <laughs> i want my parts and rec for 12 bucks a month thank you very much <laughs> yeah but why did they put an exclusive on there? Because they knew you paid yeah. <laughs> business strategy. Because you're a sucker. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't blame you. I I I subscribed. I, I just tried out Peacock because that's where all the law and orders moved. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, that's that's my comfort TV is just like Olivia Benson being like, you're the worst. Be like, yeah. And then <laughs> I love that that's your comfort TV, man. Uh, I, that show does rule. I, is that so? How many is it like a specific version of Law and Order that you like? Yeah. So, what they've done that I think was smart because, you know, I, I, I mainly watch like SVU because, um, okay. yeah. you know, it just go, it's been going for so many seasons. And I think back to watching it like on cable when, I had cable and, uh, then, you know, they, I think it was two years ago, they brought back, um, I can't remember the actor's name, but the guy who played Elliot Stabler, they brought him back as a, um, a member of the organized crime division. And they started a separate series that does a lot of crossover, but then they also revived the original law and order you know, like Jack McCoy is still there and, you know, a couple other people from the original cast, but then all of those people are also interacting. So it's like this shared, they're just this shared copy universe, I guess. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's like, uh, it, it's something I could put on in the background, but it's also something that's like, Oh, okay. They're, they're reflecting some of the, you know, because it's like inspired by true events. So they have episodes where you're like, oh, that's the Tinder swindler, the guy who like defrauded millions of dollars from women all around the world, claiming he was like this, you know, smart, eligible bachelor, famous dude, and would con them out of thousands of dollars in travel and homes and cars. And yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so it's. That's I mean, that's a, that's a good, I feel like that's a good, uh, comfort TV, you know, like, cause if you do concentrate, there is like a plot and at least like, there is like a deeper plot that you kind of have to pay attention to, you know what I mean? Um, whereas like, I just want to watch like garbage just to like shut, you know, well, not, I mean, parks and rec, I wouldn't call it. I think, no. that's you know, there's some, there's some multi layers in there, you know, there's some complex things happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. And maybe for me, I think there, a lot of my, my watching habits have shifted to YouTube partially as a way to understand the environment. Um, but also it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating to see like, you know, I think I always bring up game grumps as an example because they're like, they're like the perfect example of like how strange of an environment it is as a platform because they started as a, like a let's play channel. Like, Hey, we're just sitting here playing video games. 
but they didn't use any face cam, which, you know, is such a big trend. Like here's my face in the lower corner and now I'm playing dark souls or something. And they, so it, it felt like it was kind of like almost like a podcasty let's play format where they're just like goofing around or they talk about life or, you know, whatever experiences. Um, especially since one of the co-hosts is like, you know, like eight years older than the second co-host. So like he's in his early forties right now. And the other guys in his like closing in on his mid thirties and, but they've been doing it together for like 10 years. And, uh, in those 10 years, it went from two dudes playing video games on a couch to that's still their baseline, but they've changed like how they put episodes out. And then they've diversified where like, uh, one of the hosts is a musician, so he has a band that's also kind of popped off on the internet over the last decade, um, Ninja Sex Party. <laughs> they just make goofy, you know. Great, great name. Yeah. <laughs> they make, uh, you know, goofy uh, videos that can have, like, a wide audience appeal, but it also, you know, it hits that kind of, like, teenager, early college age demographic. and. Um, and then, you know, uh, the other host is, he has a illustration and animation background. So he'll make, you know, cartoons. He also does voice acting. Um, they've done original IP for YouTube. They started a touring company to help YouTubers tour all over the world, you know, cause a lot of people don't understand that, like, you know, like who's Jack Septicai? He's not the Eagles. How can he sell out this theater? And it's like, I don't know. Cause he's got millions of people who watch him every day. And like, there's going to be 10,000 of them in Oklahoma. <laughs> like, and, and, uh, they also have, you know, so they have like the touring, the touring company allows them to like, okay, they, they can more easily book and tour these side projects, but then, the illustrator host also started a game show of sorts to feature um, uh, other artists from the YouTube space called Scribble Showdown. And it's like people in the audience can give prompts. There's like certain prompts that are given from the host. And it's just like, you know, just fun art appreciation comedy, but there's also like a game element to it. And, and it's like, you know, it just started with two dudes wanting to play video games on a couch. And then eventually it just built out into like, Oh, they're trying all these things. They have the room to do things. There's less, you know, oversight from a higher up company being like, well, the kids seem to like these TikTok dances. Do more of those dances. Cause what was the name of that channel? Yeah. Uh, Game Grumps. Game grump grumps, yeah. I've not heard of. Them. Check them out. Yeah, it it's and it's funny because it's the same kind of phenomenon with you know you hear a musician and it's like oh let me go check out their Spotify ten million monthly listeners right right <laughs> you're like who are these guys <laughs> so it's it shows that like at least for me it shows that audiences are out there. And especially in an age where like, there's such a disparity in terms of like, you know, like some people can afford to go see certain tiers of entertainment, but then some people might not have, you know, a lot of entertainment options in their area, or they have certain, you know, disabilities that prevent them from going certain places to see entertainment. And, right. um, you know, I've seen people like that, you know, Game Grumps, I've seen like, there's a quadriplegic who's making a living as a streamer. <laughs> like he's just using all these adaptive controllers and like eye tracking software on um, his uh, computer to be able to like control and click mouses. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's, it's this interesting space to make things and like, you know, create little fun communities. Uh, and yeah, you know, I've seen all, all types of people, you know, certain celebrities have tried to get into the space. Like Jack Black is doing a good job, but 
Will Smith is kind of a meme. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's interesting to see like what stuff translates. And then on the opposite end too, there's people who, you know, like NBC tried to make a late night show with a YouTuber who, you know, on the face of it, like she has an audience and she had, you know, it's a lot of kids. She's not like amazingly funny. She's just kind of like loud, which a lot of YouTubers get away with. Um, and she tried, they tried to make a, a show with her and whoever was on the writing team, like just, it's almost like they wanted her to fail. <laughs> like the first episode was just like, let's hate white people. It was like, okay, you have to build a rapport with somebody before you start being like, Hey, you know, white people things. It's like, no, <laughs> like just wait. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. And to just see there's, you know, there's no shortage of what counts as like content. I mean, oh, there's totally. like, there's so many different presentations and uh, you know, like I, I think like one of the TikTok metas right now is people's attention spans are so shot, that <laughs> they just need four windows of things happening in a post. So they'll have like somebody talking as there's like a, you know, like a phone game in happening in the bottom and then like uh somebody raking sand <laughs> okay it just like, reminds me you watch portlandia at all oh watch? yeah that just remember there's like that one thing about like the the blinders glasses he's like shopping for a hotel and like there's all the ads and stuff and like they sell this special product that's just like blinders that takes out all the ads <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, I do, I do, I will say, like, YouTube is is a great. I don't know. I just really like that platform um, because it does seem there's like more of an emphasis on like you can like go there to like, learn stuff. You can go there to like tune out a little bit. Um, but there is like the, the, it seems like a very like specific YouTube like following, you know. And I might sound like like an old man here saying that, but um, I, like I think of like cook. I'm like super into like home cooking, you know. So I'd like follow like the Bon Appetit Test Kitchen and like oh, yeah. Maddie Madison and like those people. Like they've like just like garnered like so much attention just from YouTube alone, and like are practically like food celebrities, you know, just based off of that. So. I don't know. Yeah, like you said, there is there's audiences out there and they're all, you know, maybe they're just in different pockets or looking at different things, right? So <clears throat> Yeah. And when I think of like you know, like traditional media people, they'll talk about like, you know, they'll have like, oh, we have listeners in Iceland or something, you know, like just random yeah. analytics they'll have. And it's like you know, that is, it's the same thing of like, okay, you know, putting your song out on the internet is, you know, it's like you're casting a wider net, but it's also, it feels like that thing of like, you know, you're getting handed a fishing rod and be like, all right, you gotta go catch bluefin tuna. That's what you're going to want to catch. And here's the ocean. And then they don't give you a direct path. Right. <laughs> Um, but yeah. Oh, thing of cooking videos. Have you seen, um, uh, was it binging with Babish? I do. I do like him. Yeah. Um, there's a couple standbys. I don't like what he's done though. I will say this, like he, he started, you know, he has like a very like professional voice, you know what I mean? You never see his face. So it's like a very, it's almost like ASMR like voice. Right. But ever since, like, he did work with, and this is just my observation, but ever since he did work with, like, Maddie Matheson and, like, Brad Leone, who are very, like, out there comedic and stuff, he tries to, like, bring in comedy now to his videos. And I'm like, <laughs> it doesn't work when you do it, you know? <laughs> Stick with what you're good at, man. Oh, that's my hypercritical 
shitting on binging with Babish, but you know, he's, <laughs> he's probably a millionaire, so it's okay. Um, but he has <laughs> long story short. Let me tell you about binging with Babish. Oh, um, <laughs> Uh, long story short, I do have his chicken soup recipe is really good. Um, mm. It's chicken noodle soup. I've also done a, I feel like I've done a couple others of his that I can't, I can't put my finger on right now, but he's great. I also, I really like Joshua Weissman. Have you seen that guy? Oh um, yeah. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> he's pretty, he's pretty booming. Um, but he has some great, like, I love his like series of like budget meals where it's like this dish is like a dollar fifty a serving. Sure, you're gonna like, yeah, you'll spend like a hundred bucks at the grocery store. So it's kind of like, yeah, but if you portion this out for two months, it'll be a dollar a portion. You know I mean? but right. He has some good stuff. I made some butter chicken of his not too long ago, and it was like super easy, just great stuff. But yeah man so tell me about tell me about uh earth radio stuff um oh, you, guys yeah. got, you got a single coming out is that this week yeah uh singles coming out this week i think when this episode goes up it'll technically be last friday so it's out now but um <laughs> the uh i try to put them out on wednesdays every two weeks and we put out one last week but um the yeah we have a single uh space which we've been playing the last couple of years on our live shows mm-hmm. and that'll kick off the album release cycle you know it'll be just about a month between or month and a half i guess between the planetarium shows and when you know that single's going to drop on the 27th and then we have the full EP, uh, Mosaic Dreams, coming out on March 18th. And we're doing a show at Pyramid Scheme with uh, Lipstick Jody and Lady Ace Boogie. And um, yeah, we're, you know, we've been getting the artwork finished up and, you know, it's basically done. We're just doing little touch ups. And then um, we you know everything's mastered obviously because we're putting out single (laughs) and uh yeah it's like it's kind of the last it's the last record that uh madison recorded on uh, Mm um before he moved so it's like you'll hear madison but you also hear david on um one of the tracks like fully as a drummer and then um doing a lot of percussion stuff I mean, you're on it also. <laughs> um, so cool. that'll be cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, there's a, yeah, Serena Ray is on it too. She did some vocals. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, Terrence Massey, Caleb Elzinga, they're both on it. I remember Caleb. Yeah, Caleb was on it. That was a, that was a fun session, man. That was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I got to check. I saw like the album art. I haven't listened. You said Space is out right now, though. Uh, yeah, it'll be out like uh, this Friday. Okay. Uh, but when, the ep- when this episode drops next Wednesday, it'll already be out. <laughs> right. The magic yeah. of content. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah. Well, I look forward to checking it out. Cause I yeah. already did. Um, <laughs> no, the album art looks sweet. Who did you have uh, do that? Is that just for the single, or are you? Is that going to be for the album too? Uh, we we had that just for the single. Um, you know, it'd be fun to I don't know maybe make stickers out of it. But uh, the uh, what's her name Priya. I'm going to forget. I'll put a link or something. Uh, Priya. Priya somebody. Name is Priya. (laughs) And she, um, yeah, she uh, did the artwork. I think Justin was the one who was in communication with her. And and, um, she did the single artwork. And then she's doing the full Mosaic Dreams um, artwork, which is turning out really cool. Like just the 
like from what it originally was to what it looks like now. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's the first time we haven't used uh, like, you, you know, you think of the other releases when we put out that single in 2021, that was Justin doing a, um, an album cover or like a single image cover. And then all of the stuff before that was done by Justin's friend, um, Sky Black, who does a lot of surreal nature. -y yeah. yeah. I remember stuff. that. Yeah. Cause that was, was that on reanimate and then your first album too? Yeah, he did. He did this, the, yeah, the first album and mother's breath and reanimate. Cool. And, um, yeah. And I think, you know, I, I like how this new record, you know, it, it's, it's getting closer to like, you know, like obviously we would still use sky if it made sense in the future. Um, but it's, it's nice to like try some new elements within the band. Cause I think that's, it's, it, it's been that, that, th that thing you mentioned earlier about like not taking yourself too seriously. Um, and it can kind of like hold up things sometimes <laughs> where like, you want everything to be perfect and you want it to be exactly the, the perfect, just perfect thing. And it's like, that's never, you know, other people deem that perfect. <laughs> I don't think yeah. any artist has been like, I was perfect. <laughs> Except for, I don't know, Ingve Malmsteen. <laughs> that guy is perfect. <laughs> no, I, I get you. I get you, man. I mean, but I'm excited to see what she comes up with. That sounds super cool. Yeah. I like the aesthetic and, you know, and sometimes it's cool to just have a, you know, a different set of creative eyes. Right. So. Yeah. That's, that's one thing we were talking about as a band is, you know, we, we shot at least the first chunk of our first music video, like our first proper one. And we were just thinking like, Oh, like, why aren't we, you know, taking this thing that we've made that has a lot of room to play around in and like, you know, reaching out to people to, you know, do a video or do artwork or, you know, just try different sets of creative brains working together. And uh, I know I've brought it up too, uh, to, I really want to try and do an Earth Radio remixes project where... Right it's kind of dual service is like collaborating with other, you know, electronic artists, people who can like reimagine the, this, the stuff from our records, however they want, but then also using it as an opportunity to make like, you know, like the earth radio stem pack or something like just have our stems kind of like Al Wolfpack has like some of their singles on Bandcamp, all the stems. Yeah. Um, like it, that, that thing of like, as a creative, you're, you know, you don't just play piano. You could be an accompanist. You could be a, you know, a, a play synths. You could learn organ. You could play, you know, there's all these different avenues. Or even as a musician, as a business, it's like you're a creative, but you can also consult. You can also teach. You can also produce. You can engineer. You get <laughs> like, trying to see you know how multifaceted we can get with with stuff so now, if you release stems let me know so i can just like build little <laughs> loops in my bedroom and just mess with my gl4 yeah oh yeah i mean people it's it's interesting though because like what people are gonna listen to this on a lot of people i'm not gonna say generalize here but a lot of people are going to listen to your music on spotify i'm not going to see any money you know what i mean so it's like why not why not just like give parts away to like encourage like you know people like messing around with it right and then maybe you get like a cool product like out of it in the end you know but right <clears throat> and i was even thinking like you know, even though a lot of our stuff we didn't track to a click um, in our catalog, it's like making a drummerless track for people to play along with. 
could be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, dub. it's it you do some dub remixes, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, why not? <laughs> oh, that could actually be sweet. I could hear that. Yeah, it's funny being on a dub record of uh, I was, I'm on um, was it Roots Roots Reggae Dub or I think is the album um, from Lee Scratch Perry. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, he's that dude that like, I don't know, was a, a producer with like Bob Marley and other, you know, okay. heavy hitters in that space. Uh, but he, it's we, it's actually, it's, it's surreal to think that just because the process was remote. So it was like, we recorded stuff. Um, it, it was when, um, you know, years ago when uh, uh, Speakeasy, uh, you know, like Joe Vasquez, Olin Clark. Um, yeah. Yeah, I remember that group. Yep. Yeah, they they wanted to do some tracking, or I guess they were asked to do tracking, and they needed keys. So I just came in and had my Yamaha organ sound, <laughs> and just did some bubbles and <laughs> chords, and uh, and we tracked like I think we were there for like six hours, and we were just tracking like different keys, different speeds, different grooves, different transitions, different drum tones, different keyboard tones, guitar tones. And then he, you know, Lee just took whatever he liked and just made it into tracks and dubbed backing vocals with some other singers and, and him just kind of vibing on a lot of tracks. <laughs> that sounds sweet. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it will. Oh, uh, the other surreal part was, I don't know, because he passed like what two years ago or a year or two ago. I can't remember. Um, but his whoever's controlling his estate, <laughs> like they were, they were like, he shouldn't have died. This is a this is a problem. We're investigating. Also, here's an NFT to commemorate. And I'm like, oh no, oh, <laughs> just, like, yeah. who just got a hold of his IP? No. <laughs> oh boy. I'm like, stop. <laughs> He's dead. Leave him leave him alone. <laughs> Don't make an NFT out of him. <laughs> we want to commemorate this by ruining the financial health of thousands of people. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. But um oh speaking of new music, um, I mean Paddlebots put out that great album last year. And we got to do that co-bill. Um, and uh, I was wondering if Paddlebots is like, you know, because it's one thing to be like, new album, it's out. And mm -hmm. But with how your band is, you know, people are busy. Not everyone's living in the same area. I'm sure it's like you're kind of picking and choosing when and where to play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... So I'm sure we'll play, are you asking like, like when we're like, if we're playing like plans to play and stuff like that? Yeah. Like if, I don't know if 2023 yeah. is like some stuff's booked or. I, I'm sure we'll have some stuff on the docket for the summer. I'm sure. Um, historically, even like pre COVID um, bots takes um, like the winter months, like off. Um, mm. Just, I think a lot of it is like, we do all live in different areas and it's like, you know, everybody driving eight cars to a gig, you know, in the middle of February, like it's, you know, it's just, I think we just take it off. And then summer, summer is usually like a pretty busy year, but we'll see how we'll see what happens this summer. Um, I know that um, we are a little more, I'd say we're a little more choosy with what we're playing, but um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some, we'll, <laughs> the summer. I'm sure we will. So, yeah. Well, and, and I think that's you know important for I don't know people who are starting bands or getting bands out of the COVID 
you know, slump. It's yeah. like, you know, you could try to hit the ground sprinting, but if you're not used to that after <laughs> this amount of time, it's like, that doesn't make sense. Or if, you know, the project, it takes a lot to put together a show, like there's less, you know, it's like, instead of like, Oh, we're a trio. We can gig everywhere all the time and all fit in one car and it's easier. Like it's just thinking logistically. Cause even with a four piece, like we we're holding off, like we're doing a couple uh, runs that are going to be like regional and we might do like, some weekends that dip into Chicago, but most of it's just going to be like, what can we all comfortably carpool to, or like take two cars if anything. Right. Um, Cause yeah, we tried when we, when we went to Vermont, <laughs> we fit uh, Justin, his partner, and then me, David and Hannah all in Justin's car with all of the stuff we needed to, live with and not really instruments like I, I brought a midi controller and david brought his cymbals and a snare drum and and so it was you know all the stuff on that ep is stuff that was at the studio that was tweaked or you know we added to it um and but yeah that whole experience of <laughs> being in the car for you know such a long stretch in especially in those way back seats where it's like this kind of is a seat but it's not made for any adult <laughs> it's way too small um we we uh yeah we're we're starting to think of like all right how do we how do we grow you know our our you know base income or like get it to a point where we can comfortably start paying towards a van or something or buying some sort of decent quality used one but you know there's it's a lot of costs so <laughs> yeah 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 but i mean it's it's all it's all context right so it's like if different things make sense for different groups you know and like if you are gigging that much if you're like income from a band is like through just like constantly hitting the pavement you know it might make sense get a van especially i mean it's just the four of you too so right but i have been thinking a lot more this isn't speaking on behalf of paddle bots or anything this is just more um you know in for me choosing you know gigs i'm hired on for or something like that you know in any sort of group like something i am trying to think about more is just like you know signing on if i can signing on for shows that i know are going to be like like an experience for the listener you know what i mean um right which i mean obviously take what you can get right but they're those are i feel like those are the shows that people like show up to without you like nagging them like hey you know like i mean obviously you have to do that but like those are the types of shows that are super special because people just are like, they want to come to them and they like leave like jazzed up about it. Like I think about like, I'm sure your planetarium shows with earth radio is going to be like that. But like with normal mode last year, like that was one of those gigs where it was just like, this is so cool. And you guys hired a videographer and it was like a whole experience. It's not just like this, like, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to see, this band just because like I support them and I like kind of like the music. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm not shitting on the gig scene. Right. But I'm just, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Like, just like, or like, are like, we were both on that music that raised us show. That's like another one that I think about or. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is like, it's just, it's just cool to, if you have like a normal gig trying to think of ways to elevate it even if it's simple stuff you know that could be f more fun for the listener and maybe more marketable but i don't know that's that might just be that might just be like luck of getting on certain gigs you know obviously it's not going to be everyone but that's right. my man 
Yeah. Well, no, I, I totally get that. Um, cause I think that's, that's the last couple of years has been a thing that any, any personal group I've been involved in has, we've all been talking about that of like, all right, we know how to play our songs. We know how to, you know, we've got, we've all had years of taking gear, putting it on a stage and being like, thank you. And leaving. <laughs> it's like, how do you, you know, it's like, how do you make, how do you make an impression that's somewhere in between like in almost intentional FOMO <laughs> right. where you're like, it's like you, you take it for granted that I'm a musician that works all the time, but you missed it. <laughs> it's like, that's never happening. <laughs> but the, well, you know, <laughs> thank you for summing up. What I <laughs> Thanks. <Lee. laughs> it's, and it's, that's just the thing is like, you know, I, I, there are some people I don't even reach out to anymore. Cause I'm like, every time I, I update you with something, it's always like, like I get, you know, people have to work. Like, I'm not going to be like, Oh, do you go into that job again <laughs> to live? <laughs> yeah. But like, you're not, you're not coming out at 11 PM on a Tuesday. <laughs> well, and that's, um, that was the weirdest thing playing founders for the first time in years uh i sat in with nathan walton um well i guess i played the whole show so it's more of a i played a show with him. <laughs> and uh you know i'm used to when i worked at founders and yeah we've played founders in the past it was like all right load ins at six you got until nine to get set up checked have food and then start the show and then Sometimes the show might get pushed to nine thirty. You know, it depends on, you know, how it's feeling. But then it, you know, it goes as late as like, you know, one thirty. Sometimes, like depending on how many bands or you know what is being scheduled or what event. And then the bar would close at two, and then there'd still be you know employees around until three. <laughs> um, but when I played there like the other weekend, it was like, all right, it's Saturday night, first show of the year. And it was like, okay, decent turnout. First set started at eight show ended at 11. And I was like, Oh, what is this feeling <laughs> getting done before midnight at founders? Oh, like, wow. Uh, so I'm like, is that just going to be a, a new trend because of the pandemic? Like people, or is it like winter hours versus summer? Is it, you know, I heard, I'll, you know, I'll keep hearing it a million times from every business. It's like, we don't have the staff. And I'm like, then why, who are, how are you incentivizing people to work for you? Have you changed your business model? Do you offer benefits? What is it? <laughs> it's like, it's not my job to, you know, as a musician to like staff your business. <laughs> it's like, I've done, you know, we try to bring in people, but you know, I don't have a uh, thousands of dollars marketing budget to do it. <laughs> you know, if you're like a big brewery or something, but that's interesting. Um, I realized that they're doing earlier shows. You know, yeah. Cause now that you mention it, yeah, every gig I've played there is like, <laughs> you're not, you're not getting in your car to go home till two, you know? <laughs> but, yeah. And, and so it's, you know, I'm, it, it, my hope would be like some people might consider, you know, cause he, my parents came out even just for the first set. Cause they're, you know, they both start work pretty early and they like to, you know, be winding down by like nine 30 and, you know, getting sleep, you know, between 10 and 11. Um, but yeah, it's like, you want to with you know to get people to come to your shows it's like you don't want everyone to sound like this is only going to happen once and it'll never happen again but it, to some degree you know the people who come to, who are regular consumers of local live music who follow people's growth it's like yeah the you know this show might not happen exactly because the band's only getting better or the band isn't playing this area as much because they're growing their audience and they're being able to play more markets so it's like i don't know it's it's that thing of trying to impress upon people like hey you know i'm passionate about music 
I made this my career. I could tell you a million reasons why you should enjoy it, but I want to know like what is what's the thing that motivates you? Like I'm not a DJ. It's like if you don't like DJs or if you don't if you only like DJs, I'm not a DJ. So mm-hmm. cuts that out. It's like I'm I'm not a you know a flat picker. So <laughs> cuts that- out all that. <laughs> And it's, you know, it's like trying to hone in on like, okay, what am I making? Why do the people like what I'm making? How do I continue to like give people what they want within reason because everyone's opinions are different and some people have unrealistic (laughs) goals of like, I don't know, like the the people who are like, this band hasn't been good in 15 years. I'm like, there's still a band. (laughs) touring the world and they haven't been good (laughs) like clearly they've been good enough to tour like i don't know like maybe you don't like their music or you listen to it in high school during your formative years and it's imprinted in your psyche as like the pinnacle of art but (laughs) it's like (laughs) just come to my show (laughs) oh wow (laughs) so I don't know. It's, it's trying not to, it, as I'm, you know, thinking about all these things, it's like, I, I still have at least motivation and hope. <laughs> it's, it's just like trying to, you know, it's it, like, Oh, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. But where is the wall? And what am I throwing at it? <laughs> like, it's like, it feels like that sometimes, <laughs> but yeah, I guess, you know, I guess it just comes down to like, you know, that age old thing of just like having your own unique voice, right? Like, and that's like you, that's going to like, you're, it's not going to be able, if you're playing in a bunch of different projects, like you're still, you can't shake that off. You know what I mean? Which I'm sure like you've played with like every band of Grand Rapids, you know, I'm sure people like hire you because they're like, I want to hear the Dutchie thing you know whatever right. that means to them but like yeah it's a it's an interesting thing to like analyze that from the outside you know like what do you think what do you think people want when they ask for has anyone ever asked you to do like the dutcher thing like in a recording session it's like i don't know like just, just do the dutcher you know what i mean uh all the time at third ghost um it's just you know some singer songwriter is like i just discovered music and you're like all right let's go (laughs) great foundation get some altered dominance happening let's go (laughs) when because you know there's been i i think it's because i mean i've i've always presented myself multifacetedly um so there's been times at third coast like i feel like the core of what i do is i help people who might have demo keys or they want piano or some kind of keyboard um being able to translate that into like not just like oh let's try playing it on the roads but then to be like well if you're looking for like a warm foundation like you know roads can be a great like pad underneath these you know brighter elements in the song or uh, so there's there's that aspect of just kind of having a little understanding of keyboards um i think the vocabulary you know as much as i'm not explicitly a jazz player i play a lot of jazz (laughs) and even then it's you know jazz is a four-letter word to some people and Mm -hmm. um i think it's like being able to improvise my technique has always been strong so they like the that aspect um uh, strangely a lot of uh people want me for the like i don't consider myself an amazing stride player but some people want that on re- their recordings they want like just bouncy yeah like yeah. type of stride playing um and i think it's also i don't know like yeah i think it's a mix of how I've presented myself, you know, being in classical music school, jazz music school, you know, playing in different styles of groups. Um, 
being a, sometimes even like being able to uh, like have all the training, but not be stuck on reading, you know, like some classical musicians, they can't get out of the book. They don't, right. you know, they haven't developed their ear enough yet or they're, you know, understandably like fearful because classical music school just is like, if it's not like Vladimir Horowitz, it's nothing. Sure. Sure. <laughs> You're like he's dead. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely like, like when Nathan Walton hit me up, it was, he wanted me to do, cause you know, he already has a keyboard player. So I'm like, do you want me to do like lead stuff and like effects and things? Cause I think there's that aspect too, between normal mode and earth radio, they see a keyboard player who can kind of create different textures, you know, with gear or whatever. Um, and, uh, Sometimes little earworm hooks because I like doing little melody layers on top of stuff or something that is like a counter melody underneath what's already happening that's catchy. Um, and not like people are like, "Can you play a counter melody?" <laughs> but just like make you know, just noodle noodle around and see what happens. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway. But there, you know, like with all of that, I mean, there, you, there is like, I could like, I could pick you out in a room, you know, I don't know if it's just, I don't know if it's your feel or what, but like, I could, I can definitely like, I could hear you specifically. You have, there's something that it might, it might just be vocabulary, you know, but I'm not amounting your vocabulary, but that's, that might be what, um, I don't know, man. I think it's just like, it's, there's no getting around the work. Right. And obviously that role of yourself changing or that role of like who you are as a player is always changing. You know what I mean? And it's always like dependent on context, but like there is something to be said about just like your voice on an instrument. But we're all, I feel like we're all trying to figure it out, right? Yeah. It's <laughs> day by day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I it's... feel like guitar, guitar is one of those interesting things. Like keys always fascinate me because like you, you have to know it's a completely different instrument um, for every, for Moog, for B3, for Rhodes, you know, piano. It's a completely different avenue right and i'm sure i don't know when i was a younger stupid guitar player like wanting to hire keyboard players i would just like assume like oh yeah they could, like they could play moog too you know and organ and you know it's like no it's not what <laughs> you know when i was like playing in like more like jam band focus groups right where it's like oh but we need that patch and this patch and like soon enough like this keyboard player is like pulling their hair out because they have to have like nine different patches for this song you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's an interesting thing to think about like with guitar because like um i don't think a lot of like electric guitar players like think about their i don't know if they like really think about their roles in groups like as much you know what i mean obviously right. like it obviously depends on like the genre of music right like there is something to be said about just like the get out of the way i'm the guitar player like i'm gonna rip this blues solo and like you're gonna hear it very loudly you know yep. and there's like that is a cool that can be a really cool thing but like um something i tried i've been trying to think about more is just like like how how do you fit in as a guitar player this like very bright instrument right like how do you f how do you fit in in the mix how do you sit in the mix like what are you you know first like like i used to like hit the guitar super hard and grip my pick really hard and just like horrible technique and i was just like why is my guitar sound like i'm like playing it with an ice pick you know 
<laughs> just like little things focusing on like you know holding the pick softer and like playing with a lighter touch and then there's like the whole mess of like gear and gear acquisition syndrome and everything that's like in between your hands and like you know what people are going to end up hearing as the final product you know like forgetting to turn your delay pedal off and letting it oscillate and you can't hear it through the monitors and you know <laughs> it's just but yeah beyond the rambling it's just like a it's something i'm really trying to be more intentional about and like really listen to recordings of myself back and be like very honest like wow that like that sounded cool when you like recorded that in your bedroom but like in the context of playing it live like holy smokes dude that does not work don't do that and it's just you know it's always like you're always correcting you know and being okay with like correcting and not like being like oh i sucked at that gig you know but <laughs> Being, it's like okay this is what i'm going to work on for the next two months is like trying to get this this certain sound or something but i don't know it's interesting like when it comes to like paddle bots for example like they already have a great lead guitar player you know what i mean who's just like like ethan like he can play like, like eddie van halen is this dude like he's just and he has voc like jazz vocabulary and stuff so it's like my role in that is not really like be like the lead guy whereas like it's like more like okay you have to simulate like kind of key sounds and like soundscapes and stuff like that which is it's definitely been a learning experience like this last year and i'm like you know i'm get the more i think about it the closer i get to getting something i like but um yeah it's just like contrasting that with like a role and like a bunch of other groups I played in where like I'm the sole guitar player or like I'm in a trio and you have to fill up, you really have to be the get out of the way. I'm the guitar player guy, you know? So yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> all of that to say, it's just like going back to thinking about different keyboards, you know, learning different instruments. Right. It's, it's a, it's a interesting thing. I don't know yeah and yeah trying to find your role <clears throat> is interesting because i you know like if i'm playing in, in earth radio it's like there's not you know i'm not the only soloist or you know there might not even be a solo you know it might warrant more pedals less pedals certain sounds and then there's similar stuff that translates to normal mode but i'm more of the the lead because you know there's no singer and it's like all right i have to play melodies i have to <laughs> you know maybe i phrase a melody a certain way maybe i pick a certain tone for a certain song um you know how do i balance off the rest of the band in a smaller outfit um and yeah and then there's like i don't know the roles i have with you know like at the the college it's like all right i'm not just playing the songs i'm helping run parts i'm at times playing you know depending on how i can you know read it sometimes or voice it it's yeah. like i'm playing four to six voices simultaneously to try and like all right all right altos baritones tenors <laughs> you know all the you know basses all the parts you know let's go through this section you plug out each part all right let's play it all together and then i'm like having to partially sight read and i think back to like you know like list could do that with like orchestral scores like you could just in, in real time make a reduction of an orchestral score i'm like that's you know i don't know if that's my goal <laughs> but yeah. that would be that could you know it'd be nice to like i could improvise off of it like i could pick out keys and chords but not necessarily look at 10 staves and be like oh yeah it's just this here's oboes <laughs> um wow yeah wild. and i yeah and that's kind of where as a you know jack of many keyboard trades it's like figuring out the role i want as a uh 
um, you, you know, putting stuff, not just because it has my name on it. Cause I, you know, plenty of stuff I've recorded on has my name on it, but just stuff that's like, I've had this idea. I want to try it. I haven't made the space for it because of the gigging schedule or the more pressing work with the groups that, you know, it's like we're in the middle of recording an album or in the middle of writing a new thing or, um, and I want to be able to balance that more so that, you know, I can try things like this, you know, I have a project idea. That's like, what if I just did, you know, solo piano arrangements of Michigan songwriter songs. Like I know, you know, I've played with Mark Lavengood. I know Seth Bernard. I've played with May. I've, you know, I've done all these things where I've seen yeah. all these songwriters in action and they write cool and compelling music that, you know, a lot of people grab onto, but it's also an interesting exercise in arranging. And it's something I could also use for the old goat. It's something that is really easy to, you know, on the business end, like, Oh, it, people recognize these artists. It's easy to program these like random playlists because there's no words. <laughs> and, you know, there's that end of like, what, let's try something that's, equal parts creative, but could be a fun business angle or let's try, you know, I, I want to make like a meditation tape style thing where it's just like cool soundscapes and, and, uh, it, yeah, you should do like, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like just try Cause I think about the phenomenon of, um, I guess celebrities in general, like, Sometimes it, you know, it flops, but you think of like, like no one, no one bats an eye of like Jack Black doing music partially because he was in school of rock, but no one's like, why is he acting? Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't want him to do music. I want him to be an actor. And, and instead it's like, no, he just sold out Rio or something. Like he played in front of a hundred thousand people. <laughs> and it's like, you know, what more people are more, people seem to be quicker if they know someone like if they know someone who's not explicitly marketing themselves as a musician and then they do music there's this fandom that's there to be like oh whoa like kim kardashian maybe, you know i don't know <laughs> some or like uh it, who's the guy jeremy renner i think has a band you know uh johnny depp had that band with uh Aerosmiths with Joe Perry and like what <laughs> like pirates, like leathery pirates. <laughs> yeah, Hollywood vampires, I think it's called. <laughs> and it's like, okay, like I get why they can get in front of people because they're all famous people with money and can just be like, I want to do a thing. And then some marketing team's like, yes. But um it is funny. Yeah, because, yeah, we were talking about earlier, like, you know, how do we make an impression per show? And then it's the same token of, like, all right, what are people gravitating towards in different art spaces, but also in the space that I'm occupying? Like, what what do I put out that makes sense, but also not getting hung up on those little details and just having the time to make it happen and learn from the process? um versus like i don't know putting something out that's you know a little too vanilla <laughs> just to play it safe um or even you know like uh what's his name harris heller he's made a living mainly on youtube as a guy who like he'll do streams where he's gaming and he, you know he has a little bit of an audience there but he does a lot of um, product reviews of like creative tools. So like, you know, different cameras, different software, different, you know, tips for pr home production or something. And he also built a really large library over the years um, under, was it stream beats or something? I think it's his brand. And it, it it's all music that, on the website you can download uh like a you know some documentation that's like hey i have the rights to use stream beats in any of my streams without getting copywritten or 
having my stream taken down or muted. And um, it's like, I think he said it, 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 it's hours of music, but it's in different genres and it's all free for people to use. But he, it's almost like he created it as a, a marketing tool because it's like, it's cool to listen to in the background and it's, you know, there's hype tracks, there's lo-fi chill beats, there's different genres, but it's not like he's touring with this music. It's like he's creating a version of sync where he's not, I don't know how, I don't know how the income from it works. I feel like it's mainly just, you know, like tentacles out into the internet. Right. So, so there's, there's that too of like, <laughs> not you know you want to try a lot of things but not getting you know overwhelmed by the amount of choice you can have <laughs> well there's a lot of choices out there yeah <laughs> a lot of choices <laughs> and that's why i'm streamlining because i'm sick of choices <laughs> so if you could have like if if you had like one one instrument to play you know desert island instrument what would it be like out of your because you are like you know you're jack of all trades dude like there's a reason like you're recording you're like recording house keyboardist at third coast right so like what right what would be your one like sound to stick with hmm <laughs> i'll just suspend any logistic my brain immediately went to like what's the humidity level because that's going to play a factor to bring it in goose <laughs> humidity is no issue <laughs> it's the perfect climate for anything <laughs> every single keyboard it <laughs> it meets you where you're at yeah there's a there's a facility on this desert island that is humidity controlled <laughs> yeah once you make your choice it's perfect <laughs> that one instrument hmm my my first instinct is is like some kind of grand piano because especially in my years at grand valley it took me from thinking of it as kind of a one note type of instrument of like okay you hit the key and it happens that's the piano mm -hmm. uh but when I was at Grand Valley, it was like, oh, I can use, you know, extended techniques. I can, you know, put an Ebo on the strings. I can put, you know, a picture frame in the middle register to get this weird rat rattling sound on one piece I had to do by George Crumb. Uh, I played some of John Cage's, um, uh, like, prepared piano sonatas. And it's like, there's a lot of versatility in that instrument. I also got to see the Bode Piano Ensemble at Colorado College perform. And that's like 10 people all around an open piano, like the lid's taken off. And there's people who are pulling bow string to bow parts of the strings. There's people using like mallets to like hit different parts of the body or, you know, it, it's like creating orchestral arrangements with a piano. Um, and, you know, more exciting than piano guys <laughs> it's just piano guys um but no my, is there a way to get is there a way to get micro tonal on a piano Besides uh yeah out of like tuning your piano out of tune uh yeah li there's little bits i mean because you can like like how same way you do it on a guitar you can kind of do harmonics um like if you you know I've, I've had it where you either you know find the sweet spot and then you hit the key and then the hammer hits it and then that's like the pick attack uh, uh, sort of yeah. and then it resonates um or you can i guess microtonally the only way because my, my other thought was if, if I bring a piano, but I also have a laptop, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot I could do with that to like 
run it through, you know, run it through a program or, you know, layer it with an effect or, um, but I guess if it was just, just a piano. <laughs> oh, I just had the thought. I wonder, I don't know how it would work. I thought about those tone wood amps, the little things you stick on the acoustic guitar. I wonder yeah. if that would work on a piano. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you I'm stick sure, it but, to the lid. Yeah, I'm sure that those would work on a because it's it's made for acoustic instruments, right? I don't know exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because at first I thought it was like it was a device that you would like have to like stick inside of it to get you know any of the effects to be heard but then it's like oh no the whole body is the soundboard <laughs> so it's going to resonate wherever you stick it um you know and that's actually when earth radio played petoskey last fall we uh i i got to use a grand piano at the crooked tree art center and they just stuck like a sure beta 91 one of those like rectangular uh mics that you normally see in like kick drums he right. just slapped it on the lid and closed the lid and it was the you know the resonance from the body of the piano was picked up by the mic versus uh, like trying to mic the string noise or you know sure. um so yeah i bet that would work but piano i think piano would be the go-to just because i i feel the most comfortable on it but i i also thought about you know like could i bring like some kind of road style instrument <laughs> um but i think with piano i can get more tones than i could with roads because like roads is just like you know like it's like okay here's the roads you could brighten it or darken it you could add effects and maybe you can circuit bend i don't know <laughs> you could try your hand at that but yeah. piano it's like you can stick things in the piano you can you know use the body of the piano you can use you know there's three different foot pedals that all could be used to different effects in different ways uh yeah i think just but piano <laughs> can't get the microtones man i know <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna miss that i was thinking, you're gonna miss that you know like, <laughs> like, although, like the little dying star sound thing that you always make with your friends yeah <laughs> that, that's why i pick you out <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> it's not the it's not the ten thousand hours of expertise and constant work and practice. It's the it's the meow, meow, meow. <laughs> You're gonna miss that, man. I'm gonna on that desert island. That's what. <laughs> well, then my brain thought of like, okay, if I'm on a desert island, like I must have a lot of time to kill. So I'm sure there's a way to like, I don't know, Think like attach. Out. Yeah. Like, you know, cause the strings, you know, the, they, they have some give. So it's like, could I put a B bender on a piano? <laughs> oh, I bet you could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just that like, is, beer. talk about passive income. I don't know if that's really passive. That's more very active. <laughs> Try to invent a bee bender for a. Let's do it. Let's figure it out. Let's do it. They put on a dobro. Let's figure it out. For... Let's, just, <laughs> let's just make a guitar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, bee benders, man. That's fun. <laughs> you know, you know Kyle Brown, right? Oh yeah, yeah. He's got this guitar that I don't know if he still has it, but it's got like I'm pretty sure like every string does like a B bender, which is well, yeah. I mean, I it it hurt my brain to figure it out, but it's super fun. Um, it's like a Jack White guitar. 
Yeah, 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 for real. It had, it's just like the bridge is like just levers like everywhere. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> and um, what's the other thing? I don't do this anymore just because it was for me, like where I live, like there's just like too much variance in humidity and, you know, change in the weather where I have to, I'd have to set my guitar up all the time. But like Haruki turned me on to this like technique of setting up your whammy bar where it's like floating. But when you bend it, when you do the full um, depression, whatever, just the full pull, right? The the high E goes up um, a half step and then the B goes up a full step like a B bender. And then the G goes up a minor third. So you get like these really cool, like you can do like diatonic, like bends, you know, like almost oh. like a feel. But I had that for a little bit. And then like my, it just like wrecked my frets on my strat. But it's super cool. He still, he still does it. And it's just like, it just sounds like SpongeBob all the time, like in a cool <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it makes me think of like Mat matthias eklund that like uh scandinavian guitarist who like his brand is uh he runs those like freak guitar camps where he just brings a bunch of like guitar nerds to like learn because a lot of his techniques he'll just like because he, he's a he's a good example of like very knowledgeable about music he, you know he loves conical he loves like very you know, intense, heavy, progressive music. He just has goofy, you know, he'll write a song where he like makes a melody on like a Fisher Price keyboard that sounds like frog ribbits or he'll, you know, do really fast picking by dragging a comb on his strings. <laughs> oh. And, uh, but he makes, he's really good at like, from like seemingly nowhere because, because a lot of his guitars also have those equal temperament frets or whatever. Right. Um, so he'll just have these harmonics that like are like really strong, but really well sustained also. And then also seemingly out of like, he'll fade into them and you're like, how did, where did you hit the, when <laughs> yeah. like it just happened and like how it's so strong. <laughs> That is, that's wild. Also, like, very, very hyper-specific, but very cool. You know? Right. Those those equal temperament frets, they scare me a little bit. Are those, those are, like, the squiggly ones? Yeah, the ones that aren't, like, the shiftable microtonal ones, but they, yeah, they're not straight lines. They're, like, weird curves. Uh, yeah. Who's the guy from uh, Dirty Loops? Doesn't he have that? Oh, uh, right. Hen... Hen... <laughs> Hendrick, <laughs> what's his name? Baseman. I, I just wonder about like like bending, you know, when it comes to that. True. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's too much. Too much guitar tech. <laughs> but yeah, it's. It's yeah, the never ending. Like you learn something new, and you're like, "Can I do that?" And then you try it, and you're like, I don't. I think I need. I either need more training, or I need this specific setup. <laughs> and you know, like uh, what's his name, Glasses? Like he he uses a controller that you can't buy. Like it's it's something you have to modify. Um, and this he got it from this guy uh, Moldover. And he this tinier Akai, uh, you know, MIDI controller things and uh, took out the top end. Instead of having the normal, like, square pads, it was two rows of arcade buttons you could MIDI map. So he can, like, play bass and trigger, like, percussive stuff in his left hand. Oh. <laughs> um, huh. He also has very long fingers, so he can, like, do all those weird... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um but yeah yeah it's uh i don't know never ends 
And that's fun part about it, I guess. <laughs> but this is, yeah, this has been a great chat. I uh, appreciate you coming on the, on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, man, we've covered a lot of ground. Thanks for inviting me today. Yeah. Yeah. Where should, um, I mean, I know you mentioned paddle bots and maybe you don't want people to find you elsewhere, but <laughs> where should people find out what you're up to? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm most active on my Instagram, like as far as for musical stuff. Um, yeah, that's probably, that's probably the best bet to finding like what I'm up to musically. Um, coming up you know it's it is kind of like the slow months but i'm trying to get a little more um I'm, i will be teaching a little more lessons in 2023 so um and just kind of putting myself out there for more hired you know hired gun stuff um so i'll be i'll be talking about that in the next couple of weeks here like posting about that um I'll also be playing with, I have been playing with um, Caitlin Rose um, over the last year or so, like for her Fleetwood Mac project. Um, oh, nice. So, yep, it's like a Fleetwood Mac cover band. And we did two nights at Bell's, and I believe both of them sold out like in November. Um, so it's a super fun project to be a part of. Um, so we'll be doing a few of those over the summer around Michigan. Um, I'm trying to think of other. Yeah, be on the lookout for Paddlebots updates as we get closer to the summer season. And I'm sure that there'll be some gigs there too. So awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll be, I don't know, seeing each other around hopefully before April. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you're, are you at the jammies at all? Are you going to be? Um, I might be out of town that weekend. I actually might be. If I'm not out of town, I might be volunteering. I work through the library for those who don't know. Um, and we oh, do a sure. like, you know, this, but, um, we do, uh, we have, we run a local music streaming platform called KDL vibes, where we essentially just pay artists like an honorarium if they, um, get accepted to our catalog. Um, and that catalog that's determined by community jurors. Like you were a community jury, L lively, um, farmer, John Shelby Schneider. Um, and then also library staff just vote on different local artists that we want in kind of our library, um, streaming platform for local artists. So, um, I might be at the jammies, like promoting that, like at a table with some of my coworkers, but, I also might be out of time. So <laughs> long. <laughs> right. Well, cool. Yeah. I hope uh, the rest of your week goes well and, and the slow months. I don't know. You you can marinate in the slow months. <laughs> <laughs> Just practicing, practicing and petting cats. So awesome. <laughs> Sweet, man. Hey, thanks again for having me on, Dutcher. Hope we get to hang soon. Yeah, definitely. Maybe, I don't know. I kind of want to hit up Haruki and be like, remember that weekend we spent at your house? <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah, was <laughs> yeah let's, let's figure out something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, you take it easy, and uh, yeah, we'll be in touch soon. <laughs> All, right. All right, Dutcher. See you later, man. See ya. Hey, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Looking forward to more interviews this year. Looking forward to chatting with all sorts of musicians and music industry types in Michigan. Adam Marth, great player, great person. Go check out Paddlebots. They just put out a new album last year. It's awesome. Long time coming. Great production, great playing all around. Great tunes, a lot of earworms, a lot of ear candy and, and stuff musicians are going to be like oh, did you play an alter dominant over the like there's, all, there's a lot of transcribing opportunity for paddle bots <laughs> again if you want to support these podcasts you can go to patreon.com slash dutcher snedeker you can go to dutcher for everything else that i'm doing but until next time we'll see you in the next episode of mitten backstage take care